Hey, hey, Demon Slayer Season 4, Episode 4, to bring a smile to one's face. Tanjiro going around saving everyone's hearts. Good luck. <laughs> You're not following! Brutal, but you know, whatever. Don't spare them. To the grunt's credit, given the intensity of the training, you know that a lot of them probably would just drop it, drop out. It's a testament to them that they're sticking around. And also a testament to the Hashira. Like, imagine getting trained by people who who fought upper-ranked demons and lived and defeated them. It also doesn't feel cruel. It feels harsh, but like from the right place, if you know what I mean. <laughs> wow, that super stimulus smile. No, Tanjiro, it is you that will train me. <laughs> okay, yeah. He looks great after season three, after all those memories. I don't know if I've ever really thought about this before. The swords aspect of the show is something I feel like I would have loved at a certain point in my life, but it just sort of like came flooding back. It's got to be so gripping, so amazing. If let's say you have a singular task that means everything to you, maybe even more to you than life itself, and you have like one tool for this job and that tool or the design of that tool represents an equal level of mastery and complexity and heart that all the things you're trying to accomplish and all of your energy, all of your passion is funneled into this one thing. Like it is the vehicle of your drive for your great endeavor. It's tough for me to think about a real life equivalent to what swords are to demon slayers, but it's gotta feel so cool to get a new sword with like a new enhanced design. It becomes way more than just an object or item. It's your passion in a physical shape, your energy manifest. I'm just gonna cut just from throwing it. That's amazing accuracy too. That is pretty sharp. It's sharp. It will cut. What amazing honor it would be too for any one of these swordsmith village people to develop the sword that kills Muzan. Unfair. The master has a vision bigger than himself in his own life. He won't be around to see it, but it means that much to him. Like, it doesn't have much left, but he's giving all of it. This is the guy just dead in the background. Yeah, screaming! <laughs> That'll do it. This is a weird, like, Catch-22 type thing. You do your best when you're relaxed. But how the hell do you relax? Panic and fear probably is a mechanism to get you out of a situation, not to navigate it successfully. I mean, thinking about it that way, it might be your body deliberately shutting down your irrational faculties or your higher creative or whatever processing faculties so that you can't do it. You cannot go into the danger and have to leave it. You will certainly almost always do better if you're in a state of focused calm or maybe high energy, unencumbered focus. I don't know how you train for that. I mean, I guess that's the virtue of Mukito's training is he's terrifying and you you're gonna need to train terror simultaneously with the sword fighting, not just the sword fighting. Rough. Just my ego, my sense of self-worth, my personal value, the vision of the future. No, I mean, injuries aren't good, but... Oh, damn, Dandro. That is a very, very high standard and bar. Yeah. It's probable. It comes from a different place. He was kind of rough when he was first introduced. He's still rough, but like, it's just, I don't know, it's fundamentally different. Uh oh, time for some meddling. Time to snoop. Let's unlock the secrets of Mushiro's heart. Maybe it's your girlfriend. Maybe don't follow. <laughs> Nobody gets privacy around here if Tanjiro has anything to say about it. Mukito also has it really hard because he's responsible for their survival. He knows things they they can't possibly understand. He doesn't enjoy beating the hell out of them. He has to because he cares and he knows what they're facing. And it's probably the right approach. I mean, I think given situations where your emotions typically take control, you have two options, I guess. One is you learn how to control your emotions, which to me is definitely the more difficult. Good luck with that. I mean, there are ways. I think the overarching strategy there is pushing the barrier of your awareness of your own thoughts through things like meditation, just like observing yourself and what you're thinking, observing your emotions to create a little bit of a gap or barrier between impulse and knee-jerk reaction, developing that maximal amount of choice, to which I think there maybe is no limit. It's kind of intimidating to think about how deep that can go. Fundamentally, though, I think it's nearly impossible to like not have the emotion. So I think the other more practical approach is to develop your ability and skills so that you at least have something to work with, something to focus on, something to believe 
believe in, something else to kick in, that is also something more actionable to practice. Especially for things like this or life or death, like, you know, fighting an upper rank demon or, or any demon. You don't have as many chances to sit around training your emotional responses to demons because that involves putting yourself in the life or death game over event scenario. You can practice your fighting skills. You can train your endurance, your physical power. In any given situation or field, a lot of times the most critical moments are ones that are not really solvable without some kind of skill development prior to the event. I think everyone knows the feeling of suddenly being in an anticipated situation and having this moment of, I wish I had trained harder for this. I wish I had been more prepared for this. It's really easy to put off that critical moment in your imagination. I have plenty of time, etc. And then suddenly it's in front of you and the outcome will be determined not by some intrinsic quality of yourself, how good you are or whatever, your value as a human being or how much you want it, but by how much you prepared for it beforehand. Some people wait a little bit too late. Oh, we're gonna get a little rolling thing again. Oh yeah, there it is. Little rolling eye. Little rolling eyes. All the power of CG. Maybe this won't just be a journey into the heart after all. It'd be great if we could kill a demon, a brain demon, in the midst of our training, while training. Something so cool about the way they animate this guy, even in its simplicity. And both of them, they work so well together. That's a good point. Yeah, it almost feels like it's such a binary thing. The gap is so large between the Hashira and Tanjiro and the Grunts. You almost want to abandon the Grunts completely. The Hashira should just do everything they can to get better themselves. It's like that, huh? We'll find out. He's the youngest, isn't he? What? He's that good? This gets terrifying. <laughs> Pretty. I never said this before, but like one of the things that's coolest to me about this is not the, the fighting and the training. It's the renewed sense of purpose that they have and the unity. I don't feel like I saw that in the early seasons of the show. They feel different. Even the surly ones, you know, the ones that are a little bit more on the negative side, they have something higher now, something better. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Tanjiro wouldn't want them to hold back. In a way, that's the highest honor they could have given him. <laughs> so dispassionate. On the plus side, if they're not broken, they're going to be carved out of rock. Uh, what I, that's what I was saying about fear. You sort of gotta train this. You wanna survive life or death, you probably gotta train life or death. Good. I mean, he's just gonna catch in him anyway. I mean, this is already the exercise. <laughs> so don't, don't, don't. Let it happen. This needed to happen. Okay. But, yeah, this is exactly right. It feels right. Yeah, I've long felt the difference in this. The desire to be really nice often comes from a good place, but I think it's easy to start to focus too heavily on a more superficial level of that. So for example, taking fighting out of the equation, just interaction, you want to be nice to people. And the way that often gets translated is you want to say nice things. You want to be polite. You want to be perhaps loving in your speech mannerisms. But I think it works better and more targeted if it's looked at one level beneath that. Like what is the actual motivation? What is the actual goal? Is it the person's well-being? And if it is, and you really do have a clean and clear heart about the other person, you're not all tied up in it, you don't need anything, you're not secretly trying to take them down, you're not secretly envious of them, etc. all these things that will complicate the dynamic, then you will use the tool that's best suited for the job. So like, I've so clearly had this experience, or this range of experience, where people say things that are really, really direct to me, really harsh, painful to me, but there's something about it that's fundamentally different than someone just like hating me. This person actually sees a danger for me, let's say, or sees a 
way that I could improve, cares about me enough that my success is intrinsically linked to what they feel is the right thing to do, and took on the difficult work of bypassing or trying to blast through some of those niceties, the polite sort of superficial level, taking a risk and expending energy to give me that knowledge, right? That is sort of a deeper kindness than if they just sort of stayed on that surface level of like, oh, you're great the way you are, everything's perfect, everything's fine. Harshness can be a function of love. On the total opposite side of that, people can really hate you and have your your worst interests at heart, want to see you fail, and deliberately use niceness and kindness to keep you in the dark because they would hate to see you succeed or outshine them or pass them or whatever. I think one key sign that someone is being hard on you because they take delight on your pain, well, maybe a couple things. One is that its purpose is destructive, not constructive. The other is that for those people, it, it is sometimes hard to mask a glee in your failing or a glee in being in the, the higher position, taking shots down at you. People will use advice as a way of posturing over you. That was the slowest running animation I've seen in the show so far. Tito feels unencumbered. He feels free. Finally, a student that can keep up. Already? We were having such a good time. And you've mastered your own heart, so there's nothing for us to do here anymore. Would you like to have a soba eating contest? For some reason? <laughs> Why? Okay. For real? I mean, Tokido's already demonstrated his skill. Watch this come in useful at one point. No. <laughs> well, he'll just win. I would prefer, well, easy for me to say this. I would prefer a teacher like Tokido. Though I would hate to have a teacher like Tokido at the same time. Wow, he really stacked his own odds. Tokido just accepting his game. Watch it just hit the floor. Isn't it just isn't the, why is the nose pointing down? That's oh, better than I thought. Please, we need him to be nice to us. Our frail dispositions and sensibilities. Is it the same airplane every time? Humiliating. I guess this is a bonding experience. What if somebody... We have a lot of paper airplane experts in the crowd for some reason. Wow. Life in the feudal era was boring, huh? <laughs> Not like our lives where we have Instagram. <laughs> Way better. Poor rubes. Suckers. Imagine not having TikTok. Imagine doing outdoor activities. Imagine going outside. A long time ago, I learned one of the origami pieces from the game Heavy Rain. And anytime I'm stuck waiting somewhere with a receipt in my hand, I make it and stick it on something. There's like a trail of Heavy Rain origami birds all over Korea. We're bonding. We're bonding. Oh, I thought he'd be great at it. I see. This is the dilemma. And it, they both go really far. We're in sync. <laughs> it's our spirits, you see. They're flying true and straight in the same direction, just like the Hashira. We're divided in skill level, but not in our intent and our vision. Proud of you. <laughs> These over overjoyed, abundantly happy faces. It's like watching a Pixar movie. They crushed that challenge. <laughs> But if you leave her, it's a single point of attack. I like how she can talk now, but she still doesn't have any lines. She's just a sleepy, sleepy girl. It's tough, man. I don't know if I'd let Nezuko out of my sight. After all, they have eyes everywhere. This is really cool timing for this arc. There's still a lot of Hashira to get to know, but at this point, there's already been a lot established. There's a lot there. There are personal relationships. There's history. There's friendship. It's not Tanjiro and the Hashira. It's Tanjiro and Tokido and Tengen and... I was going to say Rengoku. The love Hashira. I still think that Muzan, in a way, is making a mistake and being arrogant by overly focusing on Nezuko, not continuing to create havoc. This opportunity of this combined spirit and overwhelming purpose and unity seems to be partly a function of Muzan's inaction. Oh, it's n not a Taisho era secret. We're starting with people we know first, it seems. This is the best training ever. This is so different. <laughs> Such a welcome change. 
This is my favorite training episode so far, and it hasn't begun yet. That also is two in a row, right, of becoming the person that protected you or saved you. Come to think of it, Sokito maybe did on his own what we saw Giyu do last episode, where like the pain of someone else's sacrifice became the fuel, the motivation, but it was sort of incomplete because of the great distress that it caused, the weight on their shoulders, the realization and growth from that being you keep the gifts, but resolve the internal distress, agony. You don't forget the legacy, it's still very much a part of you, but it becomes something beautiful, bittersweet at least, as opposed to this dark cloud that follows everywhere. In ways I can't explain, Tokido's overwhelming power feels connected to his freedom, his emotional freedom. Speaking of the best state not being panic, but relaxation or heightened focus or both. That seems to be him in a nutshell. He's very deliberate, very focused, very relaxed. There's no wasted energy. There's no mental drain. There are no other channels demanding attention. Tokido aside, I think the overall beauty of this episode is the clear and unified purpose and focus of everyone involved in the training. It's getting me excited to imagine in the future a battle where all the, the Hashira and maybe all the grunts, no longer grunts, are standing on the same battlefield. 